Nice. Modify the bottom. <laughs> okay, so again, we're going to do those five things that we always do before we do any assessment or skill, right? We introduce ourselves, we wash our hands, we provide a provided privacy, we explain the procedure. Did I identify the patient? I'm going to forget. Okay, so I got all, all five of them. Um, and then with the female catheter, you would provide perineal care, which we talked about at the beginning of the semester. Mm -hmm. right front to back, uh, making sure you use a different part of the wash pot for each stroke. So that's all done. You explain the procedure. So you're going to come in. I wiped off my table for the two minutes per the purple pot uh, protocol. I got a sterile package. A sterile package requires three checks. Intact. Good. So I check those. So now I'm going to open up my bag. And I'm actually going to grab all this so this is no longer sterile. We have some labels here. Those, and then just like when we did the dressing change, normally I would stand there. I'm going to stand it on the other side so you guys can see. Mm -hmm. But normally I stand here. Does that make sense? Because I'm going to face my sterile pill. Okay. So I'm going to open it up backwards so that I normally do so you guys can see. Okay. Which way do I open? Towards or away? Towards. Towards. I don't touch what? The one inch border. border. So you got to be careful here. I got to pinch. Because what's natural, what you guys want to do is grab there. Because that's how we open up everything in our lives. You can't grab there, that's a one inch border, right? So I got to pinch here. And when I pull it back, you see that I'm grabbing what's going to be on the outside here. So that just like when I open up my sterile gloves, I broke the seams. As I open this up, what am I going to do? I guess not break. I'm going to, I don't know, prevent the seams from causing the drape to pop back up. You see, when I move my arm, I move it around the sterile flow instead of on top of the sterile flow. These little things probably don't make a difference in real life most of the time, but if they make a difference 1% of 1% of the time, then that's someone's grandmother. Okay. Chubby fingers? <laughs> I don't like that because my drapes are borderline hanging over the edge, so I'm going to square it up for myself. Is it okay with that? And when I square it up, I had to go underneath. Okay. Now everything there is sterile, my hands are not sterile. Right? So how do I become sterile? I grab the sterile gloves with the out, and I'm going to do myself a little bit more. Not touching anything else, grab my sterile gloves. Now, if you have larger hands, you can always bring them, like in real life, I always bring another pair of gloves in because I can probably get my hands in here without ripping them, but there's a 50 50 chance. And if I'm bringing on a real patient, I don't want to take a chance of ripping my gloves. So I bring another pair of gloves in and I just use those. And you guys can do that for your test out also. The only time I can touch the one inch border, right? I'm doing things slow and methodically so you can pick up on the slight nuances of what I do. Is it wrong to keep my hand here? No. Why do I put my hand behind my back? It reminds me that I do not need to use it to pick up this glove. My right thumb you notice is up in the air. Don't tell me your, your hands won't fit into the movies. You might just do. Can you, uh, David, because I need myself, can you bring a dose for me? Like, just over here. <coughs> now I reposition it again, right? So now I reposition it from the outside. I have two drapes. With the female client, I only use one of them. And the male, I use both. There's a lot of different ways to drape your patient, it's up to you. On the female, I use this drape, which is a non penetrated drape. Again, we already talked about the shiny side goes which way? Down. Well, it goes away from where the fluid's going to be. So you can't say down or up. It depends on what you're doing. And this drape should be. 
This is a different kit than a skin This is what we call the fenestrator tube. It has a hole or a diamond in it. We use that for the male. And I'll show you how to do a male catheter in a little bit. Is that not good for the female? Inside my kit, I have surgical lube. Okay, sterile lubrication jelly. I have normal saline, pre-filled <coughs> syringe. This is a closed system. If I want to collect a sample, I have a sterile cup. It doesn't need to be sterile, but I'll show you how to collect a sample out of this, which is after the insertion. Okay. Or you could take the sample right away from the bag if you do it initially, because the inside of everything's sterile inside of there. So normally you don't take a sample from a bag. The only time you can take a sample from a bag is on the insertion of a closed system. When you insert this closed system, I can take a sample right from the bag right away. Does that make sense? Otherwise, I have to take it from the aspiration port. I don't ever take a sample from a bag that's been in for longer than right now. So if I need a sample in an hour from now, guess what? I've got to take it out of the aspiration port. Okay. Inside of this box, I have my fully catheter connected to my drainage bag. It's a closed system because it's all one. It's already connected for me. Sometimes they come not connected. You have to connect them yourselves. In which case, you would not take a sample from the bag. You would take a sample from right from the end of the catheter, which I'm going to show you how to do on the mail. I'm very cognizant of where my catheter is at all times. I don't just let it whip around. Okay, you can control my catheter. I like to open up everything over here before I go over to the patient. Again, I would be standing on that side. These are my cleaning sticks. Yes. Um, these ones happen to be, it just says skin cleanser. It doesn't tell me what the chemical is. <coughs> Little arrow tells me where to tear. On a female, we lubricate the catheter one to two inches. Three, okay. Four, no real reason to, but one or two. Three is okay. And I'll lubricate before I go there. I'm going to teach you to test the balloon. The CDC says not to test the balloon. The Cleveland Clinic does not have you test the balloon. I still test the balloon because I've seen the balloon rupture. So it's a debate in the literature. The CDC gets a professional opinion like me. I happen to know a professional that's been doing it for a long time. Me. So I disagree with the CDC. So if I ever go in the court of law, I'm gonna tell them, well, I'm glad the CDC has their opinion. My opinion is you've seen a balloon rupture upon testing that I'm gonna test the balloon. The rationale for not testing is that you weaken the balloon the second time you inflate it. You it. They feel you increase the likelihood of it rupturing. Okay, it's a, what's that, what's a, a half, what's a half, half dozen? It's a catch-22, that's a good way to think of that. So I test the balloon. On your test, don't test the balloon, and on your test ID thing, but on the examination, don't test the balloon. Does that make sense? Because the NCLEX is going to follow the CDC. So uh, you, you can do it on your test out if you want. It's, this is up to your professional decision making. That's what the saline is for? That's what the saline is for. Because once I put this in, that balloon keeps it in place, so you don't suture it in place. So I test the balloon. Okay. Southwest General's policy still says test the balloon. So they agree with me. They don't follow the CDC recommendations either because they are called recommendations, not to require or mince. See the difference? Mm -hmm. And then I also make sure I smooth mm -hmm. out the balloon so they're going to go in and cause a bridge. Once the syringe is on, there's no reason ever to detach it again. So you're going to end up just going to reattach it. So why detach it just to reattach it? Okay. With the female catheter, I literally take the catheter in. This lubrication thing is about two inches in length. Try not to get lube on your hands. If you do, it's not wrong, but it makes it hard to work with everything. You can imagine. Put everything back in my kit. Again, normally I wouldn't have that have happen because I'd be standing over here the entire time. You guys agree with that? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna grab my drape, and just like I showed you guys before with the drape, if you hold it like this, you have a chance of getting it in your hands, but if you hold it, this, then you're less likely to contain your hands because your hands are surrounded by the sterile drape, right? So now I have to go underneath the patient's hips. So I come in and see I can touch the legs with my hands, but the drape is protecting me. I'm not sure how nurses would do it any other way than this. And then I tuck. And my hands are protected the entire time because it folded a lip around my hands. Does that make sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can also have colleagues in the room that lift up the butt, or the patient can lift up the butt for you. No, I'm still sterile. I can come over here and grab my box. I don't need the whole box to be on the drape. I just need to be between 
the box and the patient to have a drink. Then I'm going to purposely contaminate my non-dominant hand. My non-dominant hand is my left side. I've set up on this, the patient's right side, for a reason. So that when I'm ready to insert it, I can be on, I can have the correct hand. Right? We just talked about how um, with our non-dominant hand, it's hard to do things. Well, I'm about to take a catheter to try to hit a hole, which I may or may not see. Right? And so I better have a steady hand. So I use my right hand for this. Okay? If you're left-handed, you'd be on the other side of the bed. I take my non-dominant hand and I separate the labia. Not as easily said as done. Are not as easily done as said. Okay, you can keep on manipulating the labia until you get to the spot where you feel like your hands are going to keep them apart. Once you start to clean, the labia cannot come back together. If the labia come back together, you must start. If you clean, if it's before you clean, it doesn't make a difference. They can come together, they can go back apart. Come together, go back apart. You can have a colleague put two pairs of put sterile gloves on and separate the labia for you. In practice, nothing wrong with that. Most of the time, when we do female catheters, there's three of us in the room, anyways, to protect us because this is very sensitive in nature. But there's someone holding a flashlight, there's someone holding the labia, and then we're all looking for the urinary meatus. Okay? I'll give you a little analogy how to find out where the urinary meatus is in a second. Okay? So, grab my swab stick. David, can you bring my garbage can where I had it initially? I should grab like it. Thank you. I'm going to do four labial fold, front to back. Near labial fold, front to back. And then I'm going to do down the middle over top of the urinary meatus, front to back. I've already done normal perinarial kill, so there should not be fecal matter, exudate, drainage, whatever else should not be there. It should just be cleaning the, uh, the labia at this point. And at any point at this point, since I started, as soon as the swab stick touched, they're coming back together, I'm starting over. Okay. I'm then grabbing my catheter. Okay. I'm going to insert and I insert one to two inches until I get urine. Once I get urine, I go another inch. So one to two inches to get urine, and then go another inch. And make sure that the balloon is all the way inside the bladder. You don't want to, you don't want to inflate that balloon inside the urinary outlet. Does that make sense to you guys? So one to two inches, get urine, and to get urine, go another inch. I see some nurses that shove the catheter all the way in every time. I don't think there's anything wrong with it from a sterile technique perspective. Um, I think it's a little bit more invasive than you have to be. Okay, so I don't do that, but I do see my colleagues. It's not one of those things where I would judge you. I say, I think to myself, okay, that makes sense. That's okay. It's a little bit more invasive than I would like, but the catheter's already going in. Once you're into one to two inches, you take your non-sterile hand, which is my left hand, and I grab the catheter and I hold it. I've now, my left hand is contaminated on purpose. It's touching the outside of the catheter, which is not going to go into the patient any further. It's going to be bouncing off her thighs, off of her gown, whatever it might be. So it's fine to, because otherwise, by the time I get to the syringe, it'll split out, and I will be at ground zero. Does that make sense? And then come down here. Is that okay? Can we figure out how to do this? This is all going to be on the outside, right? So that's okay. You guys okay with that? Now, ideally, I like to keep the syringes attached so I don't have to reattach it. I think I'm going to inflate the balloon. It should go in easily on the side of this little container. It should tell me. I'm a little green. It could, does not tell me what it says up there. 14 French, 5 mLs, just what I thought. So even though I have a 10 mL syringe, it's telling me 5 mLs. It says so, right there. Can I test you guys? Then I do the old, yep, it's in the right spot. Provide perineal care, provide modesty, privacy for your patient. Offer the use of washing your hands. Okay, now I have my gloves on. They don't need to be sterile. Where does this go? Sharps. It goes in the sharps. If I need a sample, I can get the sample right now. This is filling up with urine, right? So you get the sample out of the bag. Upon just the initial insertion, the only time you can get it from the bag is on the initial insertion. You cannot get it from the bag any other time. You get it from the aspiration port. That's a different skill. I'll show that one to you guys next week. This slides over, it's like an on and off switch. I don't like putting stuff on over the bed table, but sometimes you have to. I close it, put it back in place. This does not go on the bed rail, ever go on the bed rail. It must go on part of the bed that moves at the same rate as your patient. If your patient goes up, the bag has to go up. If the patient goes down, the bag has to go down. You don't want to be pulling it out of your patient because it's on the bed rail. The bed rail moves independent of the patient. You see the problem with that? 
So all these beds have hooks that are designed for our bags. Okay. What's the big thing that's missing from this patient that we talked about? Taping the catheter. We got taped to the leg, right? So we would use a fully securement device here. The fully securement device actually holds these two parts right here. Okay. That's where it goes. Usually the kits that I have in the hospital nowadays come with a fully securement device with it. We don't buy those kits for you guys because they're expensive. They're another fifteen dollars. You guys have to pay for a lab supply for one piece of tape, right? If you don't have a uh, fully secure device, what could you use? Silk tape, and I have a silk tape right here. And the whole point is you want to tape it in a way that when this pulls, it's pulling on the tape, not pulling it on the urethra. Okay. If I had to come back and let, I'll show that to you guys next week. It's getting late in the day. I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information. Okay. So we showed you how to get a sample out of the bag. Next week I'll show you how to get a sample out of the aspiration port. Can you just show me what the aspiration is? Right, yep. Yeah. This is the balloon port. That's where I hooked up the syringe. That's where the balloon went. To get to, you clamp this for 15 minutes, and then there's going to be urine backed up in here. You clean that with alcohol, inject a needle with a syringe, aspirate out the, the uh, mm -hmm. urine, thank you, and then you put it in your cup. Okay. The ones in the hospital will screw right on. This one requires a needle. I don't like that because needles are dangerous. Right. Okay, but these, this one has that kind of aspiration yeah, port. Yes, and that, that resells itself. Mm -hmm. I'll, sh I'll show it to you next week, but so yeah. you usually you can kind of get the idea. Why during um, initial insertion is the only time you can get urine that From way? the bag? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can get urine anytime this way, mm -hmm. from the aspiration port, because this is considered sterile because it's a closed system. <clears throat> but the so, initial insertion, you can get it from the bag, but just, just that one time. Yeah, right? because it, once the urine has been sitting in the bag for an hour, That's you don't know if you're getting contamination because you have bacterial growth in the bag or <laughs> because they have an infection in their bladder. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the only time you get is the initial insertion. When you tugged her to see if it was in, was that not was that your sterile hand or non-sterile? Doesn't make any difference because on the outside. Yeah, yeah. This is gonna touch everything. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I don't mean to be confusing, but with the okay, so when you open the box with the one inch border. Yep. I have been taught in the past. Um, or just my level of thinking that the one inch border was okay to contaminate the only place you could contaminate a lot That's of people, not right. A lot of people think that way. Okay. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're thinking I can move it around by touching this one inch mm -hmm. border. The reason the one inch border is there because we don't want to get confused about what's contaminated. So we assume that the one inch border is contaminated. So what some nurses say, if I assume it's contaminated, I can touch it mm -hmm. without my sterile gloves on, which is what you're thinking, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The I've problem is as soon as, yeah, you see them do it all the time. The problem is as soon as I touch it there, then do I have to measure another inch in to know what's contaminated or not? Do you see what I'm saying? And so if you can, not if you don't have to touch it, which you don't have to, because I can do every procedure without ever touching it, then I'd rather just avoid touching it. So I like to teach you that way. Okay. And then I'll leave it up to you, Monica. You're going to be a professional nurse. You're going to be an RN yourself. Right? You can make your own decisions about mm -hmm. you know, if, if you want to do that or you want to do it the way I did it. Okay. It, I don't want to say it's wrong because it is contaminated, but then it gets kind of like hard to know, like right. because if, if all of a sudden my catheter falls right here, I'm like, well, yeah. I'm probably okay. But if I know if I never touch that border, that's true. You see what I'm saying? That's all. I'm it's how you think about it. Yeah. yeah. So, so for test out purposes, we can't touch the one inch border. No. Okay. For test out, but once you're a professional, you're a professional. So when we test out, when you opened it, I'll look at the videos too. You kind of went under it. And yeah, hold it yeah. Out? Okay. Yeah, so okay. they're going to touch the one inch border. Okay. Which is the hardest part of opening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's easy. Open it with the one inch. All right. So I'm going to do the male catheter. I'm going to do it in five minutes.